Psalm 121. This is the Miles Coverdale translation for the Book of Common Prayer. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh even from the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not sleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself is thy keeper. The Lord is thy defence at thy right hand, so that the sun shall not burn thee by day, neither the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil, yea, it is even he that shall keep thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in, from this time forth for evermore. Welcome to the Psalms with me, James Dagpole, and I'm very excited about my special Psalms guest, William Philip. That's, is, is that what people call you, William? I get called various things, yes, but that's quite acceptable. Okay, okay. And tell me about the, the Tron Church. Because it, it's an odd word, Tron. I mean, there's a, there was a movie in the 80s, I think, called Tron. What, yeah. what is it? It's amazing how often I get asked that question. Yeah, it's uh, it's an old name. It's an old Scots name, and it comes from it means it means a weighing beam. So the Tron Gate in the city of Glasgow or wherever else it was was the place where people came to uh, to have their grain weighed and to be paid for it. So the the Tron was the um, was the weighing beam, and it was very important to have a to have a true Tron. So you got true weights and not uh, and not um, uh, you know, not people diddling you for your uh, for your grain. So, the Tron Church um, originally the name came from that. It was a, it was the second church in Glasgow after the cathedral, but it moved around at various times and uh, then joined up with other ones and had various different different additions to the name. And we were for a long time uh, called St George's Tron because the Tron congregation originally moved into. Uh, a new building called St George's, right in the city of, in the centre of Glasgow, um, and we were there for a long time until about twelve years ago. We were forced to leave our building. We had to part company with the Church of Scotland because, well, as as has been happening with the Church of England and many other denominations, um, the well, I suppose now we would call it just wokery, wouldn't we? Um, yeah, just imbibing the LGBT agenda, all of that sort of stuff, uh, just came to a head, and really we came to the point where to maintain to maintain being a Christian church we had to leave the national church that's really what it boiled down to I'm glad you, I'm glad you make that distinction <laughs> <laughs> because I mean I obviously I was aware of what's been happening in the Church of England and I suppose I, maybe I naively assume that somehow that Scotland being a kind of rigorous cold place <laughs> might might have kept some integrity with its own church, but is is is, is, the, is the Church of Scotland just like the C of E? Uh, yes, it's probably further down the road to disaster. I mean, since we left about twelve years ago, I think in about the, the last fifteen years, they've lost half their entire membership, and um, churches are closing down right, left, and centre. It's quite sad. There was an article in the Times recently saying that um, the Church of Scotland was now the biggest property agency in Scotland. They had so many properties they were selling. I'm not sure if that's absolutely true, but if you go, you'll certainly see that, that is, that's what's happening. So it's been a sad a sad case of uh, a very great decline and and all the lockdown business even just, just accelerated that and made it worse. So w- one of the few things I know about, about Glasgow is um, Rangers v um, Celtic. Um, yeah. And that there are you know, that, that it's famous for its sectarianism. Yeah. Is, is is this still the case? It is. Yes, it is. Um, I mean, I would say that that is the religion of Glasgow, but it's nothing really to do with religion. It's 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 a football based sectarianism, and it's a kind of um, yeah. It's a, there's there's it's nothing to do really with Protestants and Catholics. It's uh, I mean that's very very much in the background, but it's uh, yeah it's a pretty lively sector. It goes back to the connections with Ulster and with Ireland and um, all the immigration back and forward and so on. So it can be quite ugly at times, unfortunately, yeah. 
So, so I mean, for example, if you were out on a uh, on a Saturday night um, and uh, at a pub closing time, would the would it still be a kind of scary question if, if they asked you if you're a, a Catholic or a Protestant? Would that would that would that come up? He, yes, if that came up, you wouldn't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think. I mean, it's it's a it's a sad fact that whenever there's an old firm game, that's the Rangers Celtic uh, derbies. Um, no matter what the result is, the uh, the rate of domestic abuse goes up enormously um, on those days because people just take it so so seriously. And of course, there's a lot of heavy drinking involved and all the rest of it. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's an unfortunate. Um, it's an unfortunate aspect of our city, I'm afraid. You know, this it's not all bad. I don't want to paint it too black. Yeah. Uh, and certainly it's a it's a tiny, tiny minority, really, of the fans of each side that would be causing real trouble. And there's been very little in the way of major sort of uh, hoo-hahs uh, of late. But, um, yeah, it's... it's yeah, uh, I'm, 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 I'm curious, not so much on a, on a kind of what, what sectarian violence in, in Glasgow like but more on the level of it it greatly puzzles me that given that christianity is about sort of following jesus and given that jesus was about stuff like turning turning the other other cheek i mean nothing in his life nothing at all in his life at any moment except maybe the moment where he gets angry with the with the fig with the, the fig tree um suggests that he would ever have wanted violence being carried out in the name of of religion absolutely well i mean that's just uh it's the great reminder isn't it that you don't draw your conclusions about christ from looking at those who use or particularly misuse his name i mean the church church is full of faults uh christian believers even genuine christian believers uh, are are full of faults but you know, I'm glad that, as you say, nothing that Christ ever said, nothing he ever did, um, causes us embarrassment. Um, that's not true, is it, of of other necessarily other religious leaders or founders? Um, but it is true of the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, I, I, you know, we should be thankful for that. Well, well, definitely. And and one of my missions in in life is getting back to the pure message. Um, and I think you share my view. I mean, you're a fellow Psalms junkie, if I may. Yes. <laughs> You've just written a book about them, which I very, I very much enjoyed. Is that the Psalms seem to be a very good way of staying honest. And you, and you give loads of, loads of really good, I, I was reading your introduction and it's extraordinary how from the very earliest days of, of, of Christianity, um, the, the Psalms have been a key part of uh, all sorts of names. And you could, you, you, I'm, I'm inviting you to, to, to mention them in a, in, a, in a moment, but all the, the heavy hitters uh, in the history of Christianity have said, yeah, the Psalms are, are the thing. So tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, it is. It is extraordinary, really. Um, and, I guess you know the the Psalms, in some ways, um, are, give something of a history of the uh, of the spiritual life of the church. One of the famous commentators on the Psalms, Kirkpatrick, uh, put it like that: "It's uh, if the if the history of the of the use of Psalms could be written, it would be a history of the of the church." And you know, great ones like Augustine, um, Athanasius, Basil, all of these have have uh, have you know poured praise on the Psalms, talking about that it being a, a sort of compendium of, of all theology. I think Luther called it a, a little Bible. And, and, and they're all expressing the fact that, in a sense, the whole of Christian theology, the whole of the revelation of God in every aspect uh, is there in the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms are full of creation. They're full of uh, God's providence. They're full of his great redemption. They're full of the promise of uh, of the Christ to come and so on. So there's a there is a whole theology in the Psalms, but um, not just not just a sort of dry. It's not like a, a dry theological tome. It's it's all of it is very visceral. It's engaging, isn't it, with with human life. It's one to one engaging with God in the realism uh, of life. So there's no 
there's no sort of escapism, no let's pretend fairy tale type of thing in the psalm. So we're, we're, there's troubles all around. So let's um, let's hide away and pretend everything's nice and rosy. It's, it's absolutely somebody described it as theology in the raw. I mean, you just have to read through even the the, the first ten or twenty psalms, and you and you realise that you know there's no hiding the harsh realities of life, and yet in the midst of that, there is the wonderful revelation of the the hope, the promise. Uh, the joy that there is because of that um, presence of the Lord and that real relationship with the Lord. So it, it, it gets immediately to the heart of the Christian faith, which is, which is not really re about religion. Religion really is, is a man-made thing. Religion is man thinking of ways to reach up to heaven. You know, the Tower of Babel is the, 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 the great example, I suppose, of what it looks like on a societal scale. Man seeking God. But the Christian faith is the opposite of that. It's revelation. It's it's God coming down to man and calling man to respond to him. And the Psalms are revealing God, but also giving us the tools whereby we can respond to God, to know rightly how to do it. It gives us the very words, the, the concepts, the, the ideas, but actually the very words to verbalize, which is why you know the Psalms have been so much of the part of uh, of the of the worship of the church right right from the very beginning. Um, yes. because you know it, it transcends it, it, it they're for all time and for all believers really and that's a that's an extraordinary thing but it's it's a very wonderful one yes i one of the many things i like about them is, is that they are pure and untainted and totally trustworthy because yeah. the, the reason i mentioned sectarianism earlier on is because i i talk to i've, I've done psalms podcasts with people from various denominations and I find it troubling sometimes to hear people from a particular denomination essentially writing off all the others you, you must have you just seen yeah. this that and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mention specifics but I'm thinking that that regardless of whether you're uh, a Catholic or a Presbyterian or a woolly C of E. They've all got the Psalms in, in common and they are, okay, give or take a, a odd word of translation, they are the same same thing. Mm. So they've got that in common. And that is, I like that about the Psalms. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, well, interestingly, in the modern, in the, in the modern contemporary church, in many branches, the Psalms are, are, are fallen, fallen into disuse, uh, in many places. And I think that is a, that is a, a, a real problem. Um, sometimes it's a reaction against a particular type of quite dreary, uh, Psalm singing. And you get that in different traditions. I mean, some people love the sort of, um, the plain song of some of the Anglican chant, but a lot of people are put off by that. It's the same in Scotland. There's a great history of Psalm singing. Um, but you know, some people's experience of it has been a bit dull and dreary and, you know, a few old people sure. in an empty church. Um, so, but, but it needn't be like that. And, um, it, it, it's a terrible tragedy to, to lose the Psalms out of the, uh, out of both of our, our personal, uh, devotion, but also particularly, um, congregational, uh, congregational singing, because there's something very wonderful about the gathered people of God using the very words that God himself has given us in order to in order to praise him. Now you can go too far on that in 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 some places, and you know this has been true historically in some parts of Scotland. There's a um, you know there would be people who who would say only the Psalms and can be part of Christian worship. So there is a tradition of exclusive psalmody, um, which um, I think is I think is mistaken. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of cool though, William. You've got to admit. I mean, it's a well, fellow psalm lover. It's, it is. Hardcore. I mean, I certainly, I certainly wouldn't want to jettison them. So we, we would, we would sing psalms pretty much, pretty much every week in our services. I wouldn't feel absolutely duty bound to it, but uh, we would, we would certainly do it a lot. And it is. You're right. It's something that, it's something that every, whatever your background, whatever your Christian tradition, nobody can say the psalms belong to us. Uh, the psalms belong to the people of God, and they've been given uh, for for that purpose. And that is a is a wonderful thing. I we had to sing psalms at my boarding school and certainly there would have been, i mean in a, in a sort of sunday morning service there probably probably would have been two psalms and as a schoolboy i would look up at the at the, the board what's it called the board where they put up the, the hymns 
Does he have a special name? No. Hemboard, I think. It's the Hemboard. <laughs> okay. And you look at the and and you and you you'd say, oh, that's a, oh, we're doing Jerusalem. Great. And um, oh, oh, I like that one. You know, for those in Pearl on the Sea or whatever. And then you and then you look at the Psalms. You know, oh, right, that one. And you, I I'm not one of those people. But even now, actually, I listen to the Anglican Psalms, and I don't. My heart doesn't really fill with joy. Um, I don't think the tunes are that great. Um, um, I'd almost rather the kind of I, I like like when you watch movies and you w- watch the monks singing medieval sort of when they're doing plain chant. Uh, I quite like that, but my heart doesn't sing um, when I when it never did when I so, so I, I see the point you're making that a lot of people have put off the psalms and 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 it's funny it's only recently when I've I've suddenly got into them again that I'm grateful for that all that all those hours I put in as a reluctant schoolboy singing these things because I remember the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea and whatsoever walketh through the paths of the seas the these memorable phrases come back to you and it's it's like a sort of Proustian Madeleine moment that you get you get sort of flashbacks and and they, they stick in the mind it's one of the it's one of the um it's one of the downsides of uh modern translations or updated translations of of hymns and psalms and also bible versions is that um uh when there was only one uh, like everybody was reading the authorized version or everybody was reading a particular version of things it, it was much more easy to to remember these and memorize them but if you've grown up with gone from one version of the Bible to another to another, uh, you get terribly confused. It can become very <laughs> difficult to, to to remember these things. It's a bit like that with hymns as well. I mean, there's something good about updating words of things so people can understand them and sing them. You know, language can become confusing to people if it is very archaic. But on the other hand, things that are very well known stick in your mind. Um, you know, these days where very many people perhaps have have very little experience of of singing in church the one thing they do know is christmas carols and uh, i find it very annoying when you have the words of christmas carols updated and changed because it's probably the very only things that people might actually know and recognize and, and know very well so there is something about about the marked slightly unusual language uh, yeah. of some of the older forms which which does stick in your mind and uh, uh, and you can remember them you know decades later that's for sure I'm very old school on this one. Um, I don't think, I don't believe in language updates. I think if they don't get it, stuff them. You know, they, they, can, they can work it out. They can, they can, look, if I was a, I mean, okay, I mean, obviously I was super bright, but but even, even so, if I as an eight-year-old could pretty much guess what the Psalms are saying, I don't think that I want the church making itself more relevant by, by doing all the things, you know, having guitar strumming, whatever's to come and come and that that awful period in the nineteen seventies where 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 all these these trendy worship songs came in. I just just yeah, I I think that was the work of the devil. <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to go quite as far as that, but I uh, I I would be tending towards your conservatism on that. I would think, yeah, yeah. I mean, we uh, m- my tradition is. Scottish Presbyterian, but I'm a, some people would call us conservative evangelicals. The trouble is that to some people, the word evangelical just conjures up guitars and kumbaya and happy clapping yeah. and all of that. So I kind of I, I, I shy away a little from that. What it really just means is we take the Bible seriously and we put it centrally. So uh, I'm quite happy with genuine Orthodox Christianity. But yeah, I think you're right. You can you can dumb things down in a way that is uh that's pretty unhelpful. And, and the Psalms, you know, the Psalms are serious and you just can't, you, you, you can't, you can't mess around and dumb them down with silly tunes and things that, um, that really, you know, they just don't fit. There's a, there's a dignity and a majesty that they deserve. Totally. And now I was very interested in what you said earlier about the, the Psalms. I think you, you, you implied this if you didn't actually say this, that the Psalms are, the word of God. That, I mean, do you think we could, do you think we could, uh, do you think, uh, I mean, the, the, obviously the Muslims believe that the Quran was dictated directly by God. Yeah. 
do you think that, that we can sort of say that more or less with the Psalms that, that that David was a was a prophet that that God spoke to David and it, it not not dictated it quite but David had a hotline to God so we can take it on trust that this is what God is God is saying yeah I think I think that's true of all scripture I mean I think we don't we don't um, have that view of a sort of um, divine dictation in that as though you're in a trance and don't know what you're doing and are just you wake up and you've written a psalm um, I don't think I don't think the New Testament um, speaks that way it, it certainly tells us that no prophet was you know wrote of his own volition but was driven along by the Holy Spirit so the inspiration um, of of the Holy Spirit of the writer um, is is very important. It doesn't obliterate his personality. It doesn't obliterate his own abilities, his own experiences, and any of these things. But these things are wholly taken up and used um, by the Spirit of God, so that so that so that what is written is exactly what God wants to be wants to be written. I mean, if God is God, then He can express Himself um, in a way that He chooses, and He can choose. The instruments by which he does it. So I, I take it that God is big enough to do that without obliterating the human personality. Um, but the human personality uh, is doing what it can do, but uh, fully and uh, utterly under the inspiration and under the control of God. So yes, these words are the are the very words of of God. Although of course, um, you've got to be careful how you use that in context, because for example, if if the psalmist is speaking back to God, he is. Uh, using his own words of response, but they're the words that God has given him. So sometimes the psalmist is arguing with God um, and uh, having a tussle with him. But um, yes, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes, exactly. Now you know those those words, obviously quoted and spoken by the Lord Jesus on the cross. Um, you know, imprints very clearly that these are the words of God Himself. God in human flesh took took these words upon his uh, upon his lips and prayed them in such a way it was reverent and without sin, um, not by twisting them, but because even in its original form, when the psalmist is asking these questions, he's doing it in a way that God is helping him to do. There's ways of arguing with God that are right and reverent, and there's ways of arguing with God that are deeply rebellious and uh, and sinful, and and. The the beauty of the Psalms is it it, it leads us uh, and teaches us and helps us to respond out of whatever situation we're in in life, whatever anguish and questioning and doubts and fears and all of these things. But but to do so in a way that God Himself has given us a template for. So that that's one of the really helpful things because we all find ourselves in all the different situations at times that that the psalmist may be expressing. But left to ourselves, we can we can respond in a very wrong way. We can we can ask God the wrong kind of questions. We can do it with the wrong kind of attitudes, and all of these things. We we by nature we will we will get it wrong. But what the psalms do is 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 through God Himself inspiring the psalmist uh, to use words that that He wants him to use. It helps us to see how how we're to respond to these things. So it it, it um. It, People have called the Psalms an anatomy of all parts of the soul because it exposes every aspect of life, but it exposes our way of responding and it channels us so that we can do that in, our, in, in, in the way that God wants us to. So that's the great uniqueness of the Psalms. It's not just the very word of God, but it's the very word of God to help us use the right words back to God in response to his words. Yes. And the people who wrote the liturgy through the ages seem to have taken the, taken the hint as indeed a lot of the hymn writers yeah um when you when you're familiar with the psalms you realize that whole chunks of well certainly the church of england church service i'm sure it's out and same elsewhere um are, are basically rip-offs yeah <laughs> that's not rude of of the psalms and the same and the same with the hymns as well but that's good. I mean, that, that's how it ought to be, because um, you know that you, you're 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 simply taking parts of um, something that is truly inspired and um, a, 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 and, and weaving that into a, a new expression of it. And that means that it's far far better that than something that's 
you know, in, entirely novel. And of course, lots of the great hymn writers, Isaac Watts and others, vast numbers of their hymns really are, are paraphrases of Psalms. Yeah, yes. Well, which, which brings me back to the point you made. There are some branches of the church which have kind of jettisoned the, um, the Psalms, which seems to me like a major mistake. Oh, look, if you, if you are part of this, I, I hate to use the word religion because I don't believe in religions really, like, like you. If you consider yourself a Christian, and you should probably be reading the Bible daily, the New Testament and the Old Testament. And when you read the New, when you read the New Testament, you cannot but be very, very interested in what Jesus has to say, because he's kind of our role model, isn't he? I mean, he's he's the he's the he's perfection that we that we seek. Absolutely. Yeah. And if Jesus is quoting the Psalms, as he does more than any other bit of scripture, then what are you doing? Not, not taking them seriously because he did. Yeah. Yes, the Psalms are the most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New, um, and that is obviously very significant. This interesting. There's four. I mean, obviously, the New Testament alludes to the Old Testament all the time in different ways, but there are four big big ones that, are, that that fill it genesis because it's the book of beginnings the book of of uh, the whole you know telling us where everything came from where it's going um deuteronomy because that's the book where the whole law of god the instruction of god for life is laid out in its in its um, most full form uh, isaiah because it's the great prophet of the of the new creation but above all is uh, is the psalms and that's because the psalms contain everything but particularly i think because of you know the very very close connection with the psalms with 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 david with the the anointed king of israel he is the the messiah the anointed one of israel and therefore he is uh he himself is prophetic as well as speaking prophetically everything about him and his life points forward to great david's greatest son and what you have in the psalms in in, in a very unique way then is you have an expression you have a window into the inner life of of the messiah now david we have to think of David in, in two ways. On the one hand, he was a sinful human being, just like the rest of us. He was a man, but he was also a unique man because he, he embodied the kingship of Israel and he embodied, therefore, the prophetic hope of, 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 of the Christ to come. And his, his whole experience, therefore, um, is shaped by the experience of, of the one who's to come because the experience of of uh, of the lord jesus christ is is reflected in all of his people because his people whether from the very beginning uh in the old covenant times or uh, after his coming his people are are saved through being united with with him and so that means that his life becomes ours and our our life uh, is found in him and therefore we are um, experiencing in in a shadowy way, but in a small way, we're experiencing the reality of of the experience of the Lord Jesus. And, you know, that's that explains why Christians instinctively have have sung the Psalms. You, you read a Psalm and you instinctively know this is my song. This is reflecting my life somehow. Uh, and how can that be? Well, it's because we are united to the same Lord and Savior that the original writer of the Psalm is united to and his experience of of suffering for the sake of the, the covenant faith and so on. It's the same experience um, as Christ's people have everywhere. Yes, that's a really interesting point you make because I I really uh, miss an opportunity in my Psalms podcast to have a go at C.S. Lewis. Not not generally, but I, I really can't stand his book on the Psalms. I think it's just, just execrable. Um, and... It's not his. It's not his best one, I think. Yeah, it really isn't. It, it's like he really does think that the Psalms are this kind of Old Testament thing that the Jews, whoever he means by the Jews, had. You know, I think he means the children of Israel. That it was their thing, and that and that that somehow updated Christianity doesn't need that, you know, or, or it's not so relevant. Whereas when I'm reading the Psalms, I think. I don't feel that this is other people's stuff. I think this is very much mine. I think this 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 is I I can identify totally with the people who 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 used the psalms originally. Yeah, I think I think that's that's right. Um 
I think there, but I think there are some useful things, by the way, in, in C.S. Lewis' reflections on the Psalms. But yeah, I think there are quite a few things there you, you put your finger on. But but um, John Calvin, I think I, I think if I remember, I, I had a little quote from him in the in the yeah. preface to my book, um, where he he talks about the psalmist in his own person representing both Christ and the Christian and the whole church because we're all united to him and that's that's what explains that you see and that i think is is a very helpful way for us to uh to 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 read the psalms because when we read about the tribulations of the psalmist why is he undergoing these tribulations why 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 is everybody against the king of israel well it's because of what he represents he represents uh the gospel of god he represents the salvation of god on earth and all the forces of hell uh, are gathered against him and um, just as all the forces of hell were gathered against uh, Christ himself when he walked the earth you know it's no accident is it you, you only get a few pages into reading the Gospels when something that you hardly come across throughout the Old Testament sometimes but very rarely suddenly sort of bursts into the open everywhere there's demons everywhere there's evil spirits popping out of everywhere uh, confronting Jesus and um, you know th there's no there's no secret in that it's because when God himself is in the flesh walking this earth all the powers of hell are absolutely focused there uh, and on him and and therefore but that's a that's that's the heart of, of something that is is also true for all of those who are united with him um, and that's why David was such a focus for that because he represented the promised seed in his generation uh, on the earth. That's what explains the, the whole of the story. If you go right back to the patriarchs, why does why does all the opposition come to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, to the children of Israel and so on? It's because in every generation, those who represent the seed of salvation are being attacked at every point by, by the seed of the serpent. It comes to its climax in Christ, but of course, that's the story that, that goes on still. Um, that's why Christians are suffering today all over the world. That's why in many places Christians are terribly, terribly persecuted. Um, that's why in our culture, although we're not being physically persecuted, you know, there are many, many forces arrayed against those who would, um, who would stand for the truth of God, who would oppose some of the, um, what I would call very evil and even demonic ideologies that are uh, attacking us today. And our experience is as it is because in small part we are reflecting the experience uh, of the Lord Jesus himself. And, and the Psalms help us so much in that because it's utterly realistic about these things. And yet it reminds us constantly, the Psalms remind us constantly that, you know, we don't lose hope because although we're uh, uh, set upon on every side, the Lord is our helper. He will never leave us uh, or forsake us. Our help is in the name of uh, the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so I think that's why the Psalms are have always been such a vital source of, of strength and encouragement uh, and joy, uh, even in, in the midst of uh, great, great darkness and, uh, and, and difficult times for the Lord's people, because we feel closest to our Lord and Saviour in these moments when we are sharing in the, in the very experience that he shared uh, in his life uh, on this earth. Yes, you mentioned demons several times. Where, where are you on demons? Um... Well, I'm I'm not with them. That's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I oh, well, think that, that's a relief. I thought it, it would have been a bit worrying if I'd sort of picked a, a Satanist to do the. Um... <laughs> I mean, de de um, demons are an undeniable reality. The spirit world is a is an undeniable reality. The Bible is is clear on that from beginning to end. Uh, Satan and his legions of angels um are the enemies of uh, uh, of god's people and always have been and, and will be right until the very end i yes, think but, but some some you, you you try and get a c of e a c of e vicar to admit that he's not gonna he's not gonna go there he's not gonna he's, he's, he's <laughs> gonna think that's a bit that's a bit too yeah we've got to be we've got to be careful that um it is possible to become sort of slightly overcooked on all of that and and find demons under every bed and in the sense that uh, some christians i think can resort to um blaming demons to sort of um uh, exculpate themselves from 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 their own responsibility for sin so we've got to be careful about that but i think uh, we ca if we take the bible seriously you know our battle is not against flesh and blood but it's against the powers the principalities the, the powers in the in the unseen world and so 
you know, that is the reality behind all human evil and human wickedness. Uh, we've got to hold these things in tension. We can't absolve ourselves of responsibility. Jesus says, out of the heart of man comes all manner of evil. So we are responsible. But equally, um, uh, the Lord Jesus and his apostles teach us very, very clearly that uh, we have an enemy, the devil, who ro who prowls like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He stirs up uh, the things that lie uh, deep within our hearts. And so, yeah, we are in a, you can't understand this world without recourse to the spiritual realm. And actually, one of the, one of the things I've found, and I'm sure you've perhaps found this, James, and may even be your own experience, but in the last few years, when, you know, thinking people have looked around and seen some of the calamitous things that have been going on in the world. The, the whole COVID era was full of, you know, extraordinary deceit and yeah. wickedness and evil. I know, I know numbers of people who, who have said to me, you know, I got to the point where I, I could not explain these things without having to use the word evil. And without having to think that there is something behind mere, merely the human side of these things. And for a number of people I've known, that, that's been their, the first step towards actually Christian faith, because that's a very frightening thing to, 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 yeah. to have to come to terms with that reality. And then you're, you're, you're thinking, well, is there hope beyond this? Is, is there something greater than this? Is there, a, is there, is there, is there something to save me from this this dark world? And of course, the answer is yes. There is. There is the one who is King and Lord over earth and sky and sea and everything above the earth and under, including the entire demonic world. And Christ has yes. conquered. So, so the ultimate, the ultimate. You know, you read the Bible, and and after the first two chapters of Genesis, who do we meet? We meet the serpent. And his imprints, although he doesn't appear, uh, you know, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, he's named clearly right at the very end of the Bible in Revelation 12, Revelation 20. So the Bible begins with God's glorious creation, crowned with humans. Uh, very quickly, you have the evil one, the serpent, messing it all up, destroying it, causing calamity. And the whole of the story of the rest of the Bible is the story of that spiritual battle. Now, he was defeated ultimately forever on the cross. Satan was cast down, but his final judgment, and he's cast forever into the lake of fire. When uh, when all all who are his uh, join him there, that that's that's the story of the end of human history. So, you know, this is this is the story of uh, of the Christian faith. It's the story of the triumph of Christ, the seed of the woman, over the seed of the serpent, uh, the serpent and all who belong to him. So, without that supernatural reality, there is there is no coherent Christian faith, certainly not one that has anything to do with the Bible. I'm, I'm glad you said that, because that was what got me interested in this stuff. I was thinking, There's no point if it's just a kind of a do-gooding social mm. club um, about being nice to people, it, because, because if it were just that, you could join all sorts of similar organisations already doing that job. Yeah. Once you strip away the supernatural level, it's just it's just another thing. Yeah. Christianity without the supernatural is nothing. It is not Christianity. Uh, it, 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 and, and it's an answer to nothing. I mean, that, that's the reality. The, the answer to the problems within this world um, cannot be found within this world. Yeah. I mean, that's obvious. Nor can it be found trying to go to Mars with Elon Musk or, you know, wherever else the humans think they might find the answers. The answer is only in the one who is the maker of heaven and earth who's beyond this world and in whose hands all these things lie that's that's the glory of the christian gospel and uh because we know that there is an extraordinary hope this world can seem like it's going to hell uh but the fact is that god so loved the world that uh he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish yes so there is a great perishing but there is a great salvation and that's that's the gospel so you've known this stuff for for years, I mean, because it, have you always uh, been been a Christian? Or yeah, I was. I was very fortunate. I I was uh, I was brought up in a Christian home. Actually, my father was a uh, was a was a, a preacher and pastor, and so I was taught all these things from earliest years. For which I, you know, I thank God. I, like many, had a bit of a rebellion as a teenager, and uh, and the time came when I had to I had to decide: Do I stand with 
the God of my fathers, or do I, or, or do I not? And through various things, the Lord jolted me uh, into reality. Was, it, was and, it touch and go at one point? Um, I don't believe it was ever touch and go. I think, uh, but you know, there's a certain coming of age, isn't it? There's a time when you have to, when you have to, um, in a definitive way, say, "No, this is mine. It's not just my family heritage. This is mm. this is for me personally." And I couldn't tell you. I mean, I. I couldn't, if you ask me, when did I become a Christian? Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly when. In some ways, I feel I've never not known uh, the Lord. Uh, there have been certain times where I could look and say, well, that was a significant moment. That was a real thing for me. Um, I don't think it matters. I think much more important is, do you know you are a Christian? Um, then, then you can tell the exact time. I mean, when did the, when did the disciples become true Christians? Was it when Jesus called them from the nets and said, follow me? Well, they made a lot of mistakes after that. Was mm -hmm. it when Peter confessed, you're the Christ? Well, what about what happened after that? And he deserted him and denied him. Was it when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit? It's very hard to tell, isn't it? Uh, but uh, they were all Christians, that's for sure, by the end. But have you have you noticed um, a, an increased, um, a, a, an uptake in your in your congregation since the, the craziness of, of, of COVID and all that nonsense? Yes, well, I, I definitely have. Um, we had numbers of people came to us during that time, and partly that was because, uh, you know, we as a church uh, did kind of stand up to um, some of the uh, government restrictions and so on, um, and were you know quite outspoken about about some of the damaging things going on and we didn't want to close the church down and in fact we took the Scottish government to court uh, to, to judicial really review because in the second lockdown you might remember everywhere in the UK places of worship were still allowed to be open but not up here in um, in the free country of Scotland so um, so we we had a number of people and, and, and because of that people knew about us and, and a number of folk came seeking us because interestingly they thought well these people must actually believe in what they're talking about because they're yeah. they're willing to do something about it they were looking around and thinking well why are these churches closed they, they, they can't really have much of a message there it was it was a real own goal by the church in in general I'm afraid yeah. um, and you know when the when Simon Heffer was writing articles about the Archbishop of Canterbury and saying you know where is the church in a time of crisis um, the answer well they must be a fairly pathetic lot. So we had people coming seeking because they thought, well, these people must at least believe what they are talking yeah. about. And we've seen quite a number of people uh, coming to faith. And in my circle of friends, uh, certainly um, I've seen that a lot. So people are people are waking up to a lot of things uh, which is eroding their confidence and trust in a lot of what they've previously believed or taken for granted, a lot of the institutions that they've had trust in and you know if you if you begin to think i'm not sure i can trust anybody or anything anymore that's a terribly unnerving uh situation and so pe people i think are and have been seeking for for that truth so yeah we've seen we've seen a lot of people uh coming to faith and i think one of the things for christians and for churches to learn from that is that when you when you're not ashamed of your message when you don't hide away, when you're willing to stand up and say, I'm sorry, society, you've got it wrong. You're talking lies. This is deceitful. Um, what you're saying is, 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 is not just wrong. It's wicked. Um, we've got a better story to tell here. We've got the truth here. When we're unashamed of it, um, people will actually start to listen because they're looking for authenticity. They're looking for not trite little, you know, five minute homilies that um, tell everybody you're nice and offer a prayer and go away. I mean, nobody's, no, no thinking person is, is, is taken in by that. But so we've had people coming and saying, oh, we've tried a number of different churches. We, we, we want to find out what the Bible really says. But we've been to several churches and nobody's really talking about it. And uh, but, you know, they're willing to come and listen to, you know, a serious uh, talk and a serious exposition and examination saying, well, this is, this is what the Bible teaches. Um, and I think the problem is not that there's, the problem is not that non-Christian people are not really interested in that. I find a lot of them really are. It's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of Christian people who, who think they won't be interested and therefore aren't very confident to, yeah. to get it out there. 
Um, whereas, in fact, when you start, I have a phrase, I say, look, we need to give people the full meat. Um, throw them out a really decent hunk of serious meat to chew on and they will chew on it and then they will begin to get an appetite and, and actually look for more. I'm glad you said meat rather than, say, a banana or you know, <laughs> a, a turnip. Yes, no, solid, solid meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, did did you get any hassle from the police? You 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 kept your service, your churches open. Well, after after um, yeah, after a bit, we we didn't. No, we didn't. We didn't. We we um, we got a bit of hassle, for, for a bit of hassle sometimes from other Christians and churches who thought we were um, giving them a bad name and that kind of thing. Did you? But yeah, we did a bit. But well, how did um, that manifest itself? Oh, oh, just in, just in, uh, yeah, just in, in lots of different ways, really. But, but people, which is hard. It, it was sometimes hard for folks in our congregation, um, because friends that they had in other places would, uh, would tut tut at them. And what, for, and because what I was spreading the deadly virus it, it, through the medium of, of attending church, that kind of thing. That kind of thing, or, you know, you shouldn't be singing when, you know, it's all so dangerous and, um, you know. That, that was just made up. That was just a made up kind of. Yeah, everything was made up. So much yeah. of it was made up. And I think Christians want to do the right thing. And I, I sort of un I understand and people want to be good citizens and we should be good citizens, want to obey the government. And we should do that. But uh there are times we have to obey God rather than men. And um, I think people are a little bit willy sometimes on, on what that means. You know, the, the apostles and the Lord Jesus himself, they were all put to death by the state. Uh, the state didn't like them. And uh, they considered that they were disobeying the state by doing things that God commanded them to do, like not stopping preaching the gospel. And and I think we have to we have to be a little bit more clear on, on 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 what it means when we have to obey God. I mean, God does command us not to bear false witness to our neighbours. Well, I was not prepared to bear false witness to my neighbours by wearing a, a piece of cloth on my face as if to pretend to them and encourage them to think that this was somehow a way of being safe, when it manifestly is not a way of being safe. It's actually going to do anything. It's going to probably make you more likely to become ill. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, staying away from um, corporate worship when that is the one thing that we're commanded not to do. I mean, when Hebrews tells them not to give up meeting together, why why didn't they want to give up? Why didn't they want to meet together? Well, because it was risky to get together. <laughs> they might have been imprisoned or they might have been persecuted. They might have been killed. But he said, don't, don't give up because you need this. It's so important. So it was important, I think, for Christian leaders not to um, bear false witness by going on with along with things which were deceitful and which were full of lies, which were actually harmful to people. So I understand why why a lot of folk were confused and nervous, but um, well, I think they, they were propagandized by the government into being nervous. Yeah, well, I mean, propaganda is very powerful, isn't it? And, and you know, the Lord Jesus in Matthew twenty four, when he's talking about the times after his resurrection, that the last days, as he calls it, mm. is that, you know, there will be deceivers. And if it were even possible, some of the elect will be deceived. And um, I think a lot of Christians have, have, have been deceived. And, you know, we, propaganda is very, very, very powerful. And we, we, I think we, we don't, we don't uh, realize just how much under its power we are. But that is why we constantly need the correction and the drawing back to the truth uh, uh, of Scripture. You know, uh, the joy of the Christian pattern of meeting together week by week as the church is, and certainly ought to be, that a week cannot go by without our minds being brought back to the plumb line of divine truth, uh, being brought back to thinking clearly. I mean, the Bible the Bible and the Christian gospel is, in a very real sense, the ultimate cognitive therapy. <laughs> Cognitive therapy is about drawing you, you back into thinking in line with reality, not with something that is spurious and is um, is leading you off into a completely wrong kind of thinking and anxiety and, and so on. But coming back to the Bible week by week, more than week by week, but especially week by week as, as the gathered people of God, is the Lord's antidote 
to the lies and the deceit and the leading away uh, of the evil one. And that's why that's why the word of God and, and serious engagement with the Bible, serious teaching from the Bible on all aspects of life must be at the very, very heart of, of what the Christian church is doing. If it's not doing that, it's failing in its mission. And that's why very often, sadly, so many churches across the land, that's why nobody's going. They're empty because there's nothing to go for. Who wants to go for a bowl of thin gruel? You want to go for a full-on meal and solid meat. Yeah. They've, they, it's like serving the hundreds and thousands, but without the cake to go underneath it. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, but but God, it's God has given us this. Peter, in his second letter, is talking about what he's what what the people are to do when he, when he dies, because he's one of the last of the apostles. And what he says is, God has given you everything you need for life and godliness in His great and precious promises. And he goes on to talk about the the words of the prophets made more sure, and the testimony of the apostles who saw Him uh, in the flesh. So, the eyewitness account of the New Testament, the prophetic accounts of the Old. He's, he's given us the scriptures, and that is everything we need for life and godliness. But we need we need to have it open. We need to be reading it. We need to be taking it in, and we need to be aligning our, our, our lives with it. But the Lord has given. We don't have to wait for him to give us the gift that we need to navigate life in a, in, 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 in a world full of evil. He's given it to us. It's in our hands. It's in our language. And that's the, that's the blessing of scripture. We are... We are- don't worry, we are actually going to do Psalm 121 <laughs> in a moment. But I just quite, I quite like the chat beforehand. So I'm, I'm, I think this is an endlessly fascinating subject. And I, 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 I'm curious about things like, you, you've, you've stated what seems to me to be, duh, obvious. Um, and given that, given that we're supposed to be wise as serpents, we're supposed to have this quality called discernment. Mm. Why did so many churches fail to, to, to do their job during? When, 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 you know, it's not like it's not like the the, the, the various ministers, presumably not. It's not not as if they hadn't read read these these Bible stories. They must have had a degree of familiarity with them. Do they, do they think it's not they're not relevant anymore, or what? I think there's a whole host of different reasons. I mean, I think if you look at the sort of um, mainline churches by and large, I think, you, yes, a lot of people think they're not really relevant anymore. They're embarrassed about it. Um, I think I think those who do take, take the Bible seriously, some have been misguided because they feel, well, um, we don't want to put people off. We don't want to be seen as um, renegades. We don't want to be seen as, you know, um, going against uh, the the government and the population, so so sort of softly, softly, as it were. Um, as I said, I, I think I think that's a great mistake because I think people just take from that. Well, it obviously isn't that important. Um, if if the message we have is more important than anything else in the world, then even if we were facing a deadly killer that was killing swathes and swathes of people as some of the plagues you know in history have done even if that were true then the place of the christian church is to be in the midst of that talking about life and death and eternity and heaven and hell and the things of utmost importance not the things that will kill the body but the things can destroy the soul and that's that's what's happened in the in the past i think i think the bottom line is we're we've had a long long time of peace and prosperity and ease and we've grown very soft I'm afraid and I, I think I think that's just a that's just a big part of it I I go to I won't say where it is another part of the world uh, every year to meet with and to teach um, pastors in a country where Christianity is being very very um, increasingly persecuted and you know that faces me with the reality of of what Christian life has been like throughout most of history and is actually still like in, in, in most of the world today. I think the problem is that in our country, we've lived through an anomaly. We've lived through the aftermath of a great Christianization of our culture. And certainly in the last two or 300 years, you know, we've reaped enormous benefits from that. I mean, every, every recognizes that. Tom Holland recognizes that mm. history, you know, but, but, but I think the Christian church has, has fallen asleep because of that. And we haven't, we haven't realized, I mean, in our church, on Wednesday evening, we had a partner from uh, the northeast of India 
with us. And I mean, he was telling us some horrific things. He was showing us terrible pictures of, of extraordinary persecution of Christians, coffins and coffins, rows and rows, churches burnt down, people dispossessed, lost their houses because of, because of their faith. And, you know, that is the, that's the reality, but we've been, we've been sanitized and screened from that. And therefore, um, you know, we've just become very earthbound in, a, in our thinking. And perhaps, um, perhaps the way things are going in society and with the ratcheting up of some of the uh, ideological uh, battles, the censuring, the censorship, all of these things, it's going to be a testing time, I think, for the church. And, and maybe that is what we need in the West, not what we want. And we certainly shouldn't be, you know, in a kind of odd way, longing for persecution. To, yeah, I'm not longing uh, for it, I'm certainly not longing for that, but um, I'm afraid history would probably tell you that it's these sorts of times that really draw out uh, the faith of God's people and, and also sifts uh, the reality of those who, who truly are followers of Christ, or those who are just followers of a, a, an idea or a kind of emasculated uh, uh, Christ. You know, the... the, the, the Biblical faith is not a is not an easy thing. Uh, you just you know if you read the Bible seriously, you you understand that very quickly, don't you? Um, but I think that's why that's why you, you, people don't read the Bible much, and preachers don't deal with these difficult things because um, people don't want to hear them. You know, Paul said people will gather around them uh, preachers who will preach what their itching ears want to hear. And what people's itching ears want to hear is all sorts of things that everybody will applaud them for. I mean, no, no preacher, no church leader is going to get um, pilloried in the press if he stands up and makes speeches about climate change or Black Lives Matter or, you know, whatever the latest thing is that everybody's going on about. Um, but if he dares to stand up and say, I'm sorry, this uh, LGBT transgender ideology is wicked and sinful and it's... Yes, yeah, baffling this worship. It's it is devil worship. Um, or if he was to say, uh, you know, abortion is one of the worst crimes uh, in 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 human society today, and it is a it is a an abomination to God that nearly forty percent of all deaths in the world today are deliberately caused in the womb. Then he will be pilloried not just by the public, but very likely by his own church authorities. And we've seen cases, haven't we? We've seen cases where a Church of England clergyman says a perfectly reasonable thing in a Church of England school, in a religious Church of England assembly, and then is not only sacked by the school, but is is uh, prosecuted by his church for, uh, for 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 outrageous offences and even accused of terrorism. I mean, this yeah. is so you can understand why people and Christian leaders will say, "Oh my goodness, I don't want that to happen to me," mm. um, but. You know that's that is to just go along with worshiping worshiping the beast, isn't it? It's to bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. It's to um, you know it's it's the same battle right through the history of of the faith, and we'll be right to the end. But that's that's what we're called to. Uh, we're called do to you follow. Think, this is a, this is a tricky one. I, I, do you think? that we get a, an extra special place in heaven if we are martyred? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to put it that way because the danger of speaking about something sort of extra special introduces the idea of, um, of some sort of merit as though we sort of but there's the, there's the thing about the sitting of the, when, when on the cross they say sitting on the right hand of god so there obviously is there is a we know that heaven yeah. is hierarchical yeah 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 i think um i think you've got to you've got to be careful just how we how we talk about it i think those who have shed their blood for the sake of christ and the gospel are undoubtedly um are undoubtedly uh told um, that their names are written in heaven and, you know, that there is, the, that the Lord will be faithful to them. Uh, you know, Jesus said, 
you have confessed me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven. There's a sense in which, you know, we're all called to be martyrs. The, the word the word martyreo is the word to witness. Um, and it's an interesting one because Christians today often talk about zealous Christians who, who, have, a, who have a genuine heart desire to, to share the gospel of Christ with people will often say things like, we must have a good witness. We must be winsome. We don't want to put people off the gospel. And of course that's that's true. Um, but to have a good witness, um, what does that mean? Well, when you when you read the New Testament, you find that having a good witness usually meant you got stoned or you got killed or you got yeah, a push. Not in a fun way either. Not, <laughs> no, not, no, definitely not. Um, Stephen uh was a great witness you know uh but he was he was martyred so there is a cost to real witness and and um and so in a sense there's all real witness has the character of martyrdom because um there will be those who hate you jesus said the the gospel you can't get away from it being a double-edged sword it will be the fragrance of life unto life for some but it will be the sense of death uh, to others you can't just have the one side of the sword. You can't only have a gospel that is a fragrance of life to everybody. If you've got everybody speaking well of you, Jesus said, woe to you. Um, but when they persecute you and when they heap insults on you, when they slander you for my sake, blessed are you. So there's a, in that sense, all true Christians are called to be, to be martyrs. Now, whether, whether that is, goes to the extent of actually losing your physical life uh, for the sake of the gospel or not um there's a that we're called to be martyrs and we're called to be those who who take the um the slings and the arrows of those who are opposing opposing Christ and we're not to be afraid of that and i think if you look at it in that sense running the race keeping the faith uh looking for the crown of righteousness it, it's a right thing it's not that we earn it we you know as as jesus says in that parable you know when when, when we've done all of that all we can say is, well, I've I've done only my duty. I, the, the Lord doesn't owe me anything to uh, have stood faithful to him. But such is his grace and mercy and extraordinary generosity. Um, yeah, he, he he does reward uh, gratuitously uh, our, our faithfulness, and that that's a that's a wonderful thing. So we don't earn it, but but God gives it. Yes, that's definitely the impression I've been getting. And in a sense, let me let me um, uh, let me redeem C.S. Lewis here because he he talks very very helpfully. Can't remember where it is, but very very helpfully about this whole idea of reward and how some people feel uncomfortable about it because they say, well, you know, it's it seems a bit arbitrary. You do these things and God rewards you, and, and he says, no, 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 it's not like that at all. It's a completely different kind of reward. It's not the sort of reward that says to a child, if you practice your piano every day we'll buy a nice bicycle for Christmas. That's a totally arbitrary reward. It's unconnected with the activity itself. The real reward is to say to the child, no, practice the piano every day, and one day you will be able to play the wonderful music of Brahms and Beethoven and Bach and all of these things. So the reward is the full fruition and the culmination and the flowering of the thing itself. And if we think about our Christian life and witness like that, I think it's much, much more help, much more helpful because Jesus, that's what Jesus is saying in these parables about the talents and so on, where he says, you know, uh, it gives the different talents and, and, uh, and the one man comes back and he's had two and he's earned two more and the other one five, five more and ten, ten more. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with small things. Now I'll, I will put you over many things. And what he's saying there is, yes, the reward of eternity is, it, it, it is more of what you have made the most uh, significant part of your life here. And if, if you have devoted your life to, to laying up treasures in heaven by living this life for eternity, living it for the glory of Christ, sharing the, the gospel of Christ, then what could be, what, what reward could the Lord give you that would be more wonderful than to do even more of that forever and ever and ever? Because that's the thing that's thrilled your heart. So if you've, if you've, if the thing that dominates your life is to bring glory to Jesus, the only reward you're going to want is to have a capacity to bring glory to Jesus forever and ever in ways beyond even your uh, your earthly imagining. So I think in that sense, if you're to say, well, you're somebody who has martyred for the gospel because they've lived for Christ, they've given everything, they've, they've laid down their life, as it were, 
perhaps in reality, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Um, and you just say, well, how can I reward you? Let me do even more of this. Let, 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 let this be something that, uh, that, that goes on forever and ever. I think if you see it that way, it, 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 it's, it's a, it's a more helpful and, and, and more biblical understanding of, of what it means to be rewarded. Yes, it's certainly, I, I suppose we're rather sort of bound by our kind of fleshly view of the world. Isn't yeah. it? You know, I think yeah. of if I were being toasted on a gridiron, um, as who was, who was toasted on the grid, which, which, which saint was whatever, the, the, the one who said, turn me over, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. on that side. I would be kind of disappointed if, I went to heaven and discovered that there was more of that, more of that going on. <laughs> yes, but the thing is that you see um, the kind of person that you have become to um, to rejoice in laying down your life for Christ is reward in itself because you have become like the Lord Jesus. See, that's that's the great the great promise of the gospel is not just that one day we shall see him. But John says, we shall also be like him. Um, and you see, you might say to somebody, well, isn't that a wonderful thing that you could be like Jesus? And they might say, well, it's sort of all right, but, you know, I'd rather have billions of pounds and fancy aeroplanes. Well, there's a person that you know <laughs> has not understood the first thing about the gospel. But to say to a real Christian, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing that you one day, forever and ever, you will be like, in every way, the Lord Jesus Christ. A real Christian will will say, well, do you know, actually, when I think about it, I cannot think of anything that I would want more and anything that would be more wonderful uh, and rewarding. And yeah. and that is the reward, I think, that we're promising. So, and, and that is a great motivation, isn't it, for, for, for life in this veil of tears, is to know that Whatever is happening to us, whatever path the Lord is leading us on, all the way my Saviour leads me, as the, as the hymn goes, um, he is shaping and fashioning us uh, into, into his likeness. Um, and there is, no, there is no greater thing. There's no greater reward. And uh, if, you, if you can understand that, then you know you have, you have begun to understand what it really means to be a Christian and what it means to understand the, uh, the glory of the gospel. Well, thank you for that digression. I suppose we ought to get back to the, um, let's talk about Psalm 121. Mm. Um, now, reading your, Psalm 121 is one of the, is one of the Psalms that you talk about in your, in your book, Heart yes. Songs for Every Saint. And I read, obviously I read that chapter before this, and I realised that I had been misinterpreting the opening lines of the psalm all my life, because well, the, the version um, I know is, "I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh even from the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth." And like a lot of people, I think I assumed that the help was coming from the hills. Yeah. Yes, I think I think as certainly in the um, in the Coverdale version, I think that you uh, are quoting, and in the authorized version, um, that's how it reads: "From whence cometh my help." Um, uh, but in fact, it really ought to be as as other versions have uh, uh, a question mark: "Where does my help come from? From whence doth come my uh, my help?" And that means that the the first line about the hills is it, it is it is it. Possibly ambiguous. Uh, I don't. I think. I think it is that the hills are the source of danger. Now people disagree, and a good friend of mine who's just written a very big commentary on the Psalms takes a different view. Some think that the psalmist is lifting up his eyes to the hills, and those hills are uh, Jerusalem, oh, okay. and that's where the where the help comes from. And that, that could be, and there's arguments either way. Part of the reason for that is that this group of Psalms, um, beginning at Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, often called the Psalm, well, they, they say at the top of the Psalm, a Psalm of Ascents, or the old authorised version, a Song of Degrees, but it's just, they're thought to be um, Psalm 
part of the pilgrim praise. So three times a year, um, all the men of Israel had to go up to Jerusalem for the great feasts, Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. And they would go up in a pilgrim band. And um, it's thought anyway, I can't be certain, but it's thought that these Psalms were uh, were part of that sort of praise. And you can imagine people traveling up these roads and so on um, and singing these things. Um, but I think, therefore, you see, when you read through the psalm, it is it is full of um, uh, it's full of uh, of troubles and sources of danger and uncertainties and anxieties. And the Lord is the helper um, in the face of all of these things. And I, I think that that is what the hills represent. I mean, if you think about. Well, a good one to just think about is the story that Jesus tells of, of, of the Good Samaritan. You remember he's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and you know th these hills that they're walking through were dangerous places. That's where he gets set upon by bandits. Um, so I think, yeah, the hills, it's not a, it's not a look of longing. Um, one of the, one of the old versions of the, uh, the metrical psalm says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Uh, um, uh, no, how is it? Unto the hills around do I lift up my longing eyes. Um, but I, I think it isn't that. I do think it's, uh, I lift my eyes and I see all these hills and all the dangers and all the bandits and all the possibilities. And I'm actually quite afraid. Where, where, where am I going to find help? Yes. Well, you, you mentioned that a lot of your Scottish, um, readers, including, including yourself, yeah. have this hill bias and you, and you cannot look at mountains and hills without feeling a sense of liberation. Except I, w I wouldn't so much now in Scotland because of all the bloody wind farms everywhere. But well, yes, that's true. Yeah. Chopping up the chopping up the eagles. But I I went to boarding school <clears throat> in Malvern, um, which is dominated by its hills, which sort of rise up out of this <clears throat> fairly flat plain. And my my life for ten years was dominated by the vision of the hills, the hills on which um, Langland wrote Piers, Piers Plowman and then later on inspired Elgar. So they were a beautiful thing, although a bit depressing because they, the closer I got to those hills meant the closer I was to my boarding school after my exam <laughs> weekend or my school holidays. And I remember I used to call them the Black Hills of Death. Um, but, well, that's, but the, that's, what, that's what the psalmist is thinking about, I think, the Black Hills of Death. Black yeah. Hills of Death. Yeah. It, have you ever been to Malvern? No, no. As you drive into Malvern from on on the road that comes from Worcester, you will you, you, just before you get to Malvern Link railway station, you see this fantastic mural, and it, it and the Latin inscription "Nevavi Oculos Meos," ah. which is the beginning of the Vulgate translation. I yeah. lift up my eyes. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So, so yeah, you do, you do, but can I just, just pick you up on one point you made? I mean, we, 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 we we're obviously not going to solve in the, in the course of this conversation whether the hills are good is or bad is in this, but I think you were being slightly unfair on, on Coverdale in that it's not his words that are, that are the issue here. It, it, it's the punctuation because I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. Point. Yeah. If the, if the, if the, if, if you have a pause there and go, from whence cometh my help? That's the question. Yeah. It's when you allied the two, I will yeah. lift up my eyes yeah. unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That's where the problem. Yes. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. And in the, in the, um, in more recent, uh, versions of the Coverdale Psalms in the, in the Book of Common Prayer, there is a question mark, uh, but it notes that previously there wasn't. So it's, it's just trying to bring a bit of clarity for the sake of, Perhaps for the sake of the uh, those who are um, are not quite so good on their punctuation, yeah. But, but it is a question. On, the, on that point, though, is there not? I mean, you obviously know your your Bible better than I do. Um, and is there not a case that when it when it all kicks off, when when the really bad stuff starts happening, the people on the high ground are going to be the ones who are saved? Isn't that right? Isn't there a bit in the Bible about that? Oh, well, no, that's, that's, you know, you're talking there about, um, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, where Jesus says, when you, when you see all these things, you know, run to the hills. 
But um, but no, there he's talking very specifically about about what is coming in AD seventy. He's prophesying a, an immediate judgment on the on the on the land of Israel when the Romans came and sacked sacked Jerusalem. And um, he's saying, look, be serious about this. This is going to happen. Don't think that God is going to save his city um, anymore. Uh, so so run for the hills. And actually, those who listened, many, many Christians did save themselves by seeing that. So no, I mean, I think when the you know when the <laughs> When the when the last judgment comes and when the great throne is set, um, I think whether you're on the hills or in the valleys is not going to make any difference. It's oh. uh, you know he's gonna, he's going he's going to judge the living and the dead, and uh, there'll be no place to, there'll be no earthly uh, uh, place to hide from any of that. No. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I will lift up my eyes to the hills from what's coming up. My, my help cometh even from the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. So that's a, that's an affirmation of basic that's where we are isn't it yeah and i think you know but it's very important that the lord the maker of heaven and earth um is you know is a frequent uh, uh thing that's said of god it's quite common in the psalms uh it, it, it's it's often um a confession of faith in in the presence of great uh, distress or difficulty or threats or enemies uh, because there is enormous comfort in you know how even though the whole earth should, you know, as one of the other psalms says, quake, the mountains quake, fall into the sea. You know, if the whole earth and the whole world seems to have gone completely to pot, um, then our helper is beyond all of that. He made the heavens and the earth. He holds it all in his hands, and therefore he's the one who can, uh, and the only one who can help um, in any earthly troubles. I mean, that, again, this is just brings us back to the difference between um between the real christian faith and any other human religion or any other ideology anything that's man reaching up it, man, you know the the help that we need in this world if it's to be real cannot come from within this world it can only come from beyond and this statement of the lord who made heaven and earth is such a decisive thing because it's saying look nothing can be beyond the god who made everything even the hills he made, even uh, even the greatest threats and terrors that you might find in this world, they're all in his hand. You know, he has got the whole world in his hands and therefore uh, you need not fear. So it's an extraordinary um, affirmation of, uh, of, of faith and of trust. It, it, I mean, that's really why the book of Genesis was written. It's, it's interesting. Um, I was chatting with somebody the other day and they just said because uh, i've been writing a book on on genesis and they just said oh give me a in a, in a couple of sentences what genesis is about and i said well genesis was written by moses for his people the israelites who knew god who knew who knew yahweh the lord uh, jehovah you know the, the 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 name of god the god of israel the god of abraham isaac and jacob they knew him they had his laws they had his um help through the wilderness and all the rest of it but what Genesis, particularly the, the early chapters of Genesis, does is tells them with great clarity that your God, the God you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is in fact the God who created the universe. He's so much bigger, even than perhaps you'd ever realize. You know he's a great savior. You know he's fought the Egyptians. You know he's done all these wonderful things. But get it into your head. There is nothing in the entire universe that was not made at his hands. And um, yeah, that's a very powerful thing because... It just it just tells us that the God we're speaking about in Scripture is not just one of many. He's not just a part of the pantheon. He's not just a local tribal thing. He genuinely is the creator, the ultimate of all things. And therefore, if your help is in him, you have a sure and certain help. I wonder if you did a, a poll of ministers from the various denominations, what percentage of them would be creationists for want of a better word and what percentage would would go yeah well it was kind of evolution and there was this big bang but but probably the big bang couldn't have happened without god well it would depend it would depend where you are and which you know which culture and countries and all the rest of it um but i think and it also depends how you how you define these things but um you know at at his most basic you cannot you cannot be a christian and not be a creationist in the sense that 
God is the, is the maker of heaven and, heaven and earth. You can have different views, perhaps, about exactly how he did it. You can have different understandings of certain things. But, you know, that God made the, the world um, and not chance is an axiom of biblical faith. Yeah, you know, I we think cannot be, we cannot just be the result of an accidental collocation of atoms, as Bertrand Russell put it. You, but you, but you're still, William, you're sounding dangerously liberal to me there. I, you, you, <laughs> you realise that Big Bang theory was invented by a Jesuit. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's I, well dodgy all that stuff. I think there's all kinds of questions, and and I would have major questions about uh, about Darwinian evolution uh, and all kinds of things. Um, I don't think that means that Christians uh, ignore all science. I think Christians actually have been, right throughout history, been the true scientists. Uh, I distinguish that. For, it's, it's become very confusing these days because the science is anything but scientific. The science, uh, in the way the science is settled, the science tells us this. Uh, you know, um, we, we've got to have an open mind as Christians on on interpreting evidence and having having you know formulating scientific theories about things and all the rest of it but no god made the world he made it out of nothing he made human beings as a unique creation not just as a sort of the next step of um a random evolution i mean these things are these things are utterly basic to to christian faith yes what happened before he made the everything what was it like <laughs> what was the void like well, the Bible doesn't. I don't think. I don't think we're told enough to know. I think we're given hints of certain things. I mean, for example, uh, we were not told the the prehistory of the devil. We're not told of uh, what happened there. But but to some degree, logic um, tells us that there must have been some kind of spiritual revolt in the heavenly realms um yeah. uh you know there are hints of that i think in in places in the scriptures where you know in ezekiel and Isaiah, in certain places in some of the, the prophecies talking about the king of tyre and the king of babylon look behind that and i think are reflecting something 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 bigger but i, I think we've got to be a little cautious I, I i'm i'm i want to be careful not to go beyond what scripture um, reveals to us. I think there is a danger of getting too speculative, and and if we find ourselves more interested in in speculation about things that aren't clear, I think we can you can run into into problems and difficulties. So I, I want to be cautious uh, about that. I want to go as far as Scripture goes, and be emphatic about that. But but beyond that, it's it's difficult. There's a there's a great verse in. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 which says the secret things belong to the Lord our God but the things revealed uh, belong to us uh, and our children forever that we might do all the words of this law and I think that's a reminder that God God is God and we're not and there are things he has chosen to reveal to us and things he hasn't what he's chosen to reveal to us are the things we should really be taking ourselves uh, seriously about and, 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 and focusing on I don't think it's wrong to to speculate to a degree, because if God made the world in the beginning, then there is a before. And, you know, we're told. Paul, for example, talks about things that are hard for us to understand you know, when he says that, you know, before the creation, before the foundation of the world, God purposed to save in Christ those who are his predestined. Now, people get very tied up sometimes with, with, with that language, but, I mean, it's there. And what it's talking about is that before creation, God had a, a purpose for creation, but also for his people and also for those who's going to be saved. And the purpose, ultimately, he says, is that um, the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be manifest in the heavenly realms, not just on earth, but in the heavenly realms. So what he's saying is that from eternity, before creation, God had a purpose to display to the heavenly realms his majestic wisdom and glory and to do it through his church now you know that's a mind-blowing thing and it does your head in doesn't it yeah. all that that all that that means you know is beyond me certainly and i think it's beyond uh, all of us but but we are given we're given that so at the very least what that tells us is the beginning of everything was not genesis chapter one and the end of everything is not revelation chapter 22 it's it's part of a story that is forevermore 
And, you know, that's the word that's at the end of this psalm. So right through, all the way through the Bible, we're being told there's more, there's a beyond, there's a forever. And, and that's really what it's about. And the spiritual realm seems to be very much to the fore in all of that. And that takes us back to what we were saying earlier about demons and angels and uh, and all of these things. These these are the, the supernatural um, transcends the place of the natural, the, the, the eternal, utterly dwarfs the earthly in terms of the biblical world view. Our problem is it's difficult for us to to rise to that because we are of the earth, earthy. But that's that, that's why we need God's revelation from outside to, to, to bring this in. So he is the maker of heaven and earth in which we reside. But that very line reminds us that there's something vastly beyond all of that, something yes. far more wonderful. We're basically, we're straying into Psalm 90 territory now. Oh. I guess we are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, the next line, going back, going back to the Psalm 121. By the way, do you do you, do you do you do you spell them out as, as do you do you say them as numbers? Do you, or do you say do you have a cheat by going one two one? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. One hundred twenty one. Yeah, now I've, now I've I've flummoxed you. You have. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not sleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. I, 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 there's an example of that, that that archaic phraseology, which which is difficult. But I think, you know, it's, you can get it. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Okay, yeah. people think, what's suffering got to do with, but obviously it means he will not permit, yeah. allow yeah. Yeah. thy foot to be moved. Yeah. I think it's quite a, it's quite a good line there. It is the the ESV, which is the, the English Standard Version, which I I tend to use mostly now. is is much more prosaic. You will not let your foot be moved. Yeah. But yeah, no, I like the, the the word "suffer" sticks in your mind. You will not suffer your foot to be moved. It's a wonderful comfort, that isn't it? I mean, um, it, it it the beginning of verse three there, um, in the in the Hebrew, I think so, some people suggest that it should be. Uh, either a question or else a, 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 an entreaty. So, um, uh, will he let your foot be moved? And the answer in the second line, um, you know, uh, he will not, he will not sleep. Or it may be an entreaty, um, let not my foot be moved. Let, let not. But either way, it's, it's giving, it's giving an emphatic answer. And the answer is no, he will not. He will not let your foot, you will not suffer it, uh, to be moved. And why is that? Well, because, He's watching over you all the time. He keeps you. Um, that word keeps is, keepeth, um, is, uh, occurs, I think, five or six times, I think, isn't it, in the, in the psalm? And it's a, it, it's a great word, shamar. It means to guard or to keep or to watch over. Um, interestingly, it's the word that's used, it's the word that's used in Genesis 2.15, where God puts Adam in the garden, um, to work it and to keep it. Um, some of the modern translations do it very feebly and weakly to, 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 to tend it, but the word is to guard it. Um, God puts yeah, man in his garden um, to keep it, to guard, which, which, me, and the image there is of, um, of a soldier guarding. And it's very interesting because Adam's, Adam's job was to, was to guard the garden from anything outside it that might taint it or, 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 or bring evil into it. And then, of course, in chapter three, it's the very thing he fails to do. He doesn't guard it. And the serpent comes right in and, and, and messes it all up. And then at the end of Genesis three, we're told there's an eight, the fiery seraphim put at the, at the, at the gate of the garden to guard the way, to keep the way to the tree of life. So that, 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 that tells you that it's a, it's a strong word. And God here is, um, is guarding, keeping, watching over, protecting. Uh, so that your foot will not be moved. And he's doing it unstintingly. He will not slumber. He will not sleep. And again, that's, it's a very powerful image. It's definite. It's not, well, hopefully you won't, but it's, you will not, um, because God is awake and guarding. And so that's a great comfort. Keep would be the, so there's a game, I think I may have invented it, although somebody else I'm sure has done it before me, but this is quite a good game. You, can you sum up a psalm in one word? So, for example, so, so can you pick the word that is a representative of a psalm and guess it? So if I were to say to you the word excellent, 
Which song would that be? Uh, probably Psalm 8, perhaps, would it? Is that, you, you're there, you see? So yeah. it's, it, it, it does actually work. No, it's, it's good. Every, word, but every psalm has a, a special word, which is the, the yeah. clue word. Anyway, that well, certainly this, keeps certainly keep is the is is if not the word, it's only one of the big words here. He he is the he keeps you. So we've got the Lord himself. The Lord himself is thy keeper. The Lord is my defense. Thy right hand. This is another great phrase. So that the sun shall not burn thee by day, neither the moon by night. I love the idea that the moon might be able to burn you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's interesting. I've got yeah, the the authorized version has smite, um, which I think probably is a is a is a closer translation of of the word. Um, he's used burn because of the um, because the way the sun smites you is by burning you, obviously. Yeah, I mean, again, this is where we have to read we have to read the scripture not um, not woodenly. You know, some people read the Bible in a very wooden way, and they they can't <laughs> they can't see where he's he's talking beyond just just the literal he's talking here about all the dangers that might afflict you by day or by night there may be shades here of the sun and the moon gods i mean um the sun and the moon were worshipped by many of the, uh, the, the 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 pagan peoples around israel um i mean abraham was a moon worshiper before he was called so there may be there may be reflections there of you know none of these none of these scary gods can touch you um, but I think probably it's more it's more talking about the the, the natural world, not even the sun or the moon, uh, because God made all of these things, and He made the world for man. He didn't make you to be subservient to to the creation. Um, and again, that's a you know that's that's such an important thing, isn't it? Because we're living through an age where it's just so obvious. Um, well, to use use Paul's words in Romans one. The very essence of, of of sin and rebellion is turning things upside down, inverting biblical reality, worshiping not the creator but the created thing. And of course, we're certainly in our society today. You know, we're doing that with knobs on, aren't we? The the the, the green religion is a worship of the created thing and not the creator. It's a it's a totally turning on its head of all of this. It's a worshiping of the sun and the moon and thinking, oh, the sun and the moon. Are going to harm us. They're going to kill us. The world's all going to burn up, and we're all going to die. And this psalm says, "Don't be so ridiculous." God made the sun and the moon. He made them for you. Yes. In fact, in Genesis, in Genesis chapter one, uh, the word sun and moon is not used deliberately. He just calls them the great light and the lesser light. I think oh, probably he? that's. I think that's probably a polemic against people who thought the sun was a god or the moon is a god. He's just saying, no, there's a big light and a little light. And God put a big light in for your daytime and a little light for night. And the reason he gives is they're there to rule the calendar. So God put two lights in the sky, one in the day, one in the night. And the whole purpose of them is to serve mankind, to rule your calendar. And in particular, to serve the calendar in terms of, you know, the the, the, the ritual life of Israel, the 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 the, the the Sabbath by Sabbath and the month and the, and the new moons and the feasts and so on. So the creation is here not to not to harm humans, but but to serve humans. And um, and uh, and God will not let it harm you. And, and nothing in the natural world, therefore, can ever ultimately harm uh, God's people. He's not he's not meaning, you know, if you lie out in the sun all day just because you trust Jesus, you won't get sunburned. I mean, it would be a facile reading to, to look at that but what he's saying is nothing in this natural world can ever truly and ultimately uh, harm god's people because they're for you not not uh, not to rule you although on a digressive note william <laughs> um i have recently discovered well, fairly recently that you tan so much better without sun cream that sun that sun cream is is i i used to be i used to be an absolute obsessive junkie of some kind. yeah well all um, you do all you do then is get yourself vitamin d depleted yeah what you what you do is as is obvious you you limit your sun exposure to those periods of the day when the sun's rays are not at the most fierce yeah and you gradually build up this this protection and it well that's just another it's just another great um one of the deceptions, isn't it? Uh, the great dermatology deception. I mean, you know, 
I used to think I was a doctor, as you know, perhaps before I was in in ministry, and um, yeah, the, the the number of things that I believed because I was propagandized with then, which actually, when you start to look into it, is is a lot of nonsense. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. I bet you believed in vaccines. I did. I did, in a way which I do not anymore. Did... Uh, certainly, certainly not to that extent. Um, absolutely, yeah. The, the the levels of the levels of corruption in the world should not surprise a Christian, but they do constantly surprise us, don't they? And uh, you know, yeah, the the out of the heart of man comes all manner of uh, all manner of wickedness. But uh, but yes, no, I mean, just to get to get back to the the the, the real point here is um, he he's saying that you know you will have you will have as a believer in the one true god through jesus christ you will have real protection throughout all the trials of life he's not saying um the trials of life will not come to you um he's not saying you'll be automatically immune from all troubles in life how could that be true the whole bible everywhere tells you that that's not true the psalms constantly bear witness to that's not true but what it does is is you will have protection look at look at what it says that the the lord is your defense upon your right hand it means he's he's really really close to you he's nearer to you than all these threats he's right at your right hand and so when you face the, the natural troubles of life that every human being will face because we live in a fallen world because we live in a world under the curse christians are not exempt from illness they're not exempt from cancer we're not exempt from all the things that are common to humanity but we will have um, the protection of god uh, in the midst of it he will be there he will be our keeper right in the midst of it and that's and that's a powerful thing because what it means is that we can walk even the valley of the shadow of death but we will not fear as psalm 23 says because you are with me your rod and staff comfort me strengthen me his uh his uh, defense is upon uh, your right hand yes uh, well, that's, yes that, well that's the next one isn't it uh, the, uh, the lord shall preserve thee from all evil yeah. yea it is even he that shall keep thy soul yeah. the lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth forevermore that's a sort of reiteration isn't it of, of his yes and i think that that again that that is what shows us that this is this is not just talking about an earthly journey to jerusalem the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, as with any pilgrimage, it's a it's a microcosm. It's a it's an enactment of the pilgrimage of life, and the psalm is obviously talking about the whole of life because it's talking about from this time forth and forevermore. It's not talking about a never-ending journey to Jerusalem that was going to come to an end in a, a matter of days or weeks, but it is talking about going out and coming in uh, forevermore. And um, what he's saying is that death itself cannot harm you if your life is in the hands of of the eternal god now and forevermore a lot of people a lot of christians even are very very reluctant to to see anything in the old testament that really speaks of um eternal life that speaks of life from the dead that speaks of resurrection but i i i i I, i'm astonished because i just think well what are you reading? You know, how far are you reading in the Old Testament? The resurrection is everywhere. Hebrews 11 tells us explicitly that Abraham knew that God could raise Isaac from the dead. That's why he was willing to put him on the on the altar. Abraham was looking for a better country, a heavenly one. They were looking to the reward. I mean, right through the scriptures. And the psalmist is constantly talking about forevermore. And the way the way they looked at life was was at a as a walk with the Lord, which never ended. You know, the story of Enoch way back in uh, the early chapters of Genesis. Enoch walked with God and was not. And it's a wonderful picture. He walked with God and just kept on walking with God and his walk transcended death. And that is what the psalm is talking about here. What else can it mean? You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth forevermore, walking with the Lord. And he uh, will preserve it. He'll preserve your life. And that life will go on forevermore in his presence that is the that's the heart of the promise of the of the bible and actually you know that's when the apostle paul was defending himself in the ends of the acts of the apostles against the different authorities and so on and the jews he said i'm i'm not saying anything other than 
the historic hope of Israel. Why should any of you think it's a strange thing that we should be speaking about rising from the dead? He says, this is, this is what God's people have believed right from the very beginning. Now, of course, we have more detail and complete clarity and understanding now because we've seen the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's the first fruits and we're all part of that. How it all happens and how it was all uh, going to be fulfilled is now wonderfully clear in a way which it was less clear uh, before. But that psalm is there is pretty clear, isn't he? The Lord is going to keep you from henceforth and forevermore. Hey, although you, you say in your introduction that all human emotions um, are in the in the psalms and that they cover everything, which is which is true. But I would say that if you had to sum up the dominant message of the psalm, okay, well, psalms, it would, well, thou shalt not be afraid would be one of them. I mean, that's the most common message throughout the Bible. But I would say that it is, if you put your trust in God, then he will take care of you. Just have faith and everything's going to be okay. That seems to, and, and this, this, this psalm is a classic example of that. It's like, it, that's why I think they're such a good source of comfort. Because if you can believe that, he's got your back. God's got your back. It is. And, but I would want to, I would want to add to that, agree, agree with that, but add to it just the detail of saying that it's not, it's not just God, G O D. Look, look at, look at how repeatedly, um, he is referred to in this psalm. Um, verse two, my help comes from the Lord. He's the God who made heaven and earth. Verse five, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your defense. The Lord preserves you from evil. The Lord preserves you going out and, go, and coming in. So that is the, 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 the name of the Lord. The, it's the covenant God, Yahweh, Jehovah. Um, very specific. He's not saying any old God or a vague understanding of God. What he's saying is that this is, this is the Lord. This is, this is the God of Israel. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, uh, and, uh, and Israel. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God who reveals himself from the earliest days to the fathers, who reveals himself all the way through the scripture, but who now in these last days, as Hebrews 1 uh, says, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. So in many ways in the past, through the prophets, the poets, he spoke to our fathers. But in these last days, he has spoken in his son, who is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact image of his person. So, so the wonderful thing that, that, um, that, that we have from this psalm is that we know the name. This God has a name. He's not, it's not just that if only we could find this God, we might be able to have all these things. It's that this God has a name and he can be found and he has made himself known. And he has made himself known in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, the wonderful thing is that in, in a sense, this psalm, the Lord Jesus is on both sides of this psalm. He is, he is the one who trusts fully in the Lord. He is the one who the Lord kept. He is the one who the Lord preserved from all evil. He is the one who the Lord brought out of death to life. Um, but he is also the one who is speaking and promising all these things to his own because all who are his uh, can pray this this psalm in him. So we're praying to him. He's the one who keeps us in that. And that's really what makes this relevant, because if this was all about a theory or a, a distant theology, uh, we could say, well, how, how do I get into this? How does it happen to me? But the answer is, well, Jesus has come and said, well, come to me and I'll, I'll give you all of these things. I will give you this rest. I will give you this protection. My rod and staff will be yours. And so it's not that he can't be found. He's he's made himself known. And uh, and that is that is just the promise of the gospel, whether it's here in the in the psalm or whether it's uh, uh, Jesus speaking in Matthew's gospel or whether it's the apostles uh, proclaiming his name. Um, he's the God who says uh, and still says, well, come to me and all of this will be yours. You can have that ceaseless guidance all through uh, all through life. You can have that protection and all the trials of life. You can have that absolute certainty of promise of unending life. But as Peter says, you know, it's in his name and his name. There's no other name uh, under heaven uh, by which we can have these things. And so there is a real challenge here. It's an offer from God, but but that offer has to be has to be received. And 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 yes, he has done it. He will do it. 
throw your trust on him. That's the that's what the, the, the psalmist is proclaiming to us, really. I'm not going to keep you anymore except to ask you to tell that very moving, um, impressive the behavior, Christian behaviour story about the minister in your church, about what happened to him, the one who had the bone marrow. Yeah, yeah, no, he was a he was a uh, an elder in the in the church of a, a friend of mine. Yeah, this was some years, some decades ago. But he he had a I, I forget exactly, but he had a kind of um, hematological a blood cancer, and it was the kind of thing whereby um, it's treated by what's called bone marrow rescue. So they take some of your bone marrow, they take it out of your body, and they store it, and then they blast you with toxic chemotherapy to kill off. All the all the marrow cancer cells and all the blood cancer cells and so on and then and then you are rescued. They infuse your your own healthy bone marrow back into you and um, and the hope is that it will um, it, it, it will regrow and so on. And and the the tragedy in this case was that the freezer in which this man's marrow was being stored um, somehow there was a power cut or something. And anyway, the freezer failed and it had all defrosted when they came to. Uh, to do the rescue, it was all ruined, and so there was no rescue for him. And uh, I mean, you would think that in a situation like that, all hell would break loose. There would be lawsuits and uh, outrage and anger and all these things. And in a sense, so should there be. But um, yeah, my friend told me about this man. and said, "Well, he just said to the doctors at the hospital." This is very disappointing, of course, but I am a Christian. My life is in the hands of uh, the Lord. Uh, I don't fear death. I know where I'm going. Uh, I'm not going to sue you or any of these things. Um, but uh, my trust is in is in the Lord. My life is in His hands, and uh, He was able to face death with a with a with a steady eye, um, because he could say the words of these psalms. He knew the Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my keeper. He will uh, preserve my going out, my coming in forevermore. And in the end, you know, we're all going to, unless the Lord Jesus comes, we are all going to um, see the grave. We're all going to walk the valley of the shadow of death. The question is, are we going to walk through it with him being our shade at our right hand, our protector, our life's um, our life's uh, protector and keeper uh, or not? And 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 the Lord Jesus repeatedly says, don't say no, <laughs> come to me. And and the wonderful thing is, wh where, whoever comes to me, he says, I will never cast out. What could be more simple? Why would anybody, especially as you get older, especially as you face the realities of the sun by day and the moon by night and the and the terrors and, and the valley of the shadow, why would anybody not want to have the Lord as their keeper? It's astonishing to think that you would. I'm with you, William. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, now, thank you. Here is your here is your book, <laughs> Heart Heart Songs for Every Saint. Um, available us, on the available on the dreaded Amazon, but um, is it? Yeah, I make no money from it, so uh, you, you can, I can quite happily promote it, and I hope it might be a uh, bit helpful to some. Just to my, my aim, really, James, is to give people a taster of the Psalms, a, a little bit of half a dozen different kinds to, to to whet the appetite for more. I mean, your your appetite is already whetted. Um, it probably is. Yeah, I, I think this will be a good a good sort of um, taster book for for um, until I can write my epic <laughs> Psalms <laughs> book, which will be bored to death. I James Dallinpole bores you to death with everything he knows about the Psalms. That's well, a, friend, a, friend of, a friend of mine has just written uh, a commentary on the Psalms, which runs to four huge volumes and uh, costs a great deal of money. Uh, I mean, it'll be it'll be absolutely excellent. But um, yeah, I can, that's a bit beyond me. A small paperback with a taster is uh, is sort of about my limit at the moment. Uh, no, I, I, I've, I've, I've very much enjoyed reading it. And, and where can people find you and find your services and stuff like that? Yeah, um, just... Uh, tron.church is our church website uh, you'll find it there you'll find all our uh, talks you'll find some of our other resources you'll even find some of the psalms and hymns that i've written there's a few psalms that i've put to uh, musical tunes oh yes you have haven't you you've done psalm 91 
Psalm 91 is printed in the book there, yeah. Um, and that goes to the tune of the Ashokan Farewell, which is rather lovely. But if you go to our website, um, in fact, the, there's a recent recording of some of these um, really nicely done, some solos and some choir and that sort of thing. Um, they did it for my 20th anniversary at the church as a little gift for me, which was really lovely. And uh, uh, it's there on the website. So people can enjoy that. There's lots of resources. And one of the most important resources is actually written by my father, who uh, wrote... Um, Bible notes on the whole Bible and you can sign up to getting a daily Bible reading note if you like which which gives you in your email box every morning just a short little reading from the scriptures uh, every day lots of people uh, all over the place use those and find them very useful so there's various things like that and uh, we just love to share them with folk none of it costs anything um, it's just part of our ministry so www.tron.church and you should find all of that there and you'd be very welcome and come along and find us in Glasgow well, well, great. Well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, if you've, dear viewers and listeners, um, don't forget to support me at the usual places if you want to, if you want to get early access and stuff. But but more importantly, maybe spread the word. I mean, I imagine you, if you're watching this, you're probably a Christian or you're probably kind of tempted. And I, I, I enjoy these, these, these psalm podcasts and I hope you do too. So I'd like to see them go around the world. Um... Just because it'd be nice, wouldn't it, William? It'd be... It would. It would be lovely. And I certainly enjoy them too. And, and I know lots of people who do. So, yeah, do do listen to more. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have a cup of tea now. We've, uh, this has been quite a long evening.